From spinning seed to the maple syrup on your breakfast table, there's a whole lot of science at work. Some is completely out of our control. Other science needs the steady, careful hand of a well-informed maple producer to make it happen. Let's start with the maple seed. It's often called a helicopter seed because its blade functions as an airfoil, much like the blades of a helicopter or drone. But for the maple seed, the lift provided by its blade is only designed to slow down its fall from the tree. By spinning through the air, the seed increases its hang time long enough to travel further out of the shade from its parent tree. That's important because it will need sun to thrive once it starts growing. A seedling's leaves use a process called photosynthesis, using the sun's energy with carbon dioxide and water to create sugar in the plant and give off oxygen. Gotta love that sunshine. A healthy, self-renewing forest needs some sunlight getting to the forest floor. And that means the trees in here will probably give you a little bit sweeter sap. So a good forest manager can better the chances of new maple seedlings by thinning out trees that are growing too close to each other, especially by eliminating those that are diseased, are weak, or have structural problems. The remaining seedlings will grow more quickly and be ready to share their sap sooner. Good forest management also keeps the soil from being depleted by erosion by keeping a full complement of tree roots filling the soil and holding it in place. Minerals in the soil are drawn up into the tree's roots along with water and give maple syrup some of its unique flavors. This process of drawing water and minerals from the soil is enhanced by major shifts in temperature, going back and forth below freezing and rising above freezing, creating a unique vacuum pool in the tree. The Earth's tilt on its axis creates a seasonal climate swing only in certain latitudes on our planet. The northeastern United States and Canada experience a cyclical weather pattern and also have good soil conditions for growing maples. That's why this is the leading maple producing region in the world. How great is that? Most of the science we've discussed so far has been out of our hands. But once we start gathering maple sap, the science is much more hands-on. Usually, the most efficient method of gathering sap from a sugar bush is by a network of plastic tubing which draws the sap toward a vacuum pump house. A partial vacuum works by creating unbalanced air pressure. This helps the tree to send its sap out the tap hole and pull sap down the tube toward the lower pressure. This is actually the same process used in the tree roots we just mentioned and in a drinking straw. Normal atmospheric air pressure pushes down the drink in your cup up your straw into the lower pressure created inside your mouth. Hmm, that's pretty good. I think there's some maple in there. Once the sap is gathered, there's still a lot of water in it. Native Americans use a freezing and refreezing process to remove some of the excess water. Boiling the water out as steam has become the preferred modern method to turn that sap into syrup. But it takes a lot of boiling, and that takes a lot of energy. So, many maple producers use a process called reverse osmosis first. Reverse osmosis takes watery sap and forces it through a very fine mesh filter. The filter catches big molecules easily, but water molecules are much smaller, so most of them pass through the filter. The bigger molecules are sugars and the minerals that give maple syrup its particular taste. Reverse osmosis often removes between 50% to 80% of the water in maple sap. One more thing before we boil that sap. Not trying to be nosy here, but we need to know the boiling point of water today at your location. Atmospheric pressure decreases when less air is weighing down above you. So if you're living higher than sea level, like up in the mountains, there's less air above you. Less air pressure means it takes less heat to turn the liquid water into bubbles and gas and exit as steam. Oh, and how's the weather? That can also change the boiling point. Maple sap needs to be heated at 7.1 degrees Fahrenheit above water's boiling point in order to make syrup correctly. Otherwise, it will cook into something else, like maple cream, maple candy, or ultimately maple sugar. So watch your recipe carefully in order to get what you're going for. Most larger maple producers cook with these high-tech monsters. Evaporators like this give you a lot of control over how your maple sap boils its way to becoming delicious maple syrup. The proper application of heat is this machine's most important task. The pan is subdivided to allow cooler sap just entering the pan at one end to be warmed without cooling the sap already in it. 
The sap now flowing through to the other end of the pan is being concentrated into syrup as it goes. Extra elements can be added to increase the evaporator's efficiency. Steam can be recycled back into the heating process so the process requires less fuel. That fuel burns in a wood-fed firebox or an oil burner under the pan. Lastly, the finished syrup should be bottled hot. That makes it free of living microbes and vacuum sealed. The small amount of air at the top of the bottle compressing as it cools. This keeps the syrup fresh and free from any contamination and all natural sweetener from the trees. As you can see, there's a lot of science behind maple production. If you're interested in science with sweet results like this, check out more of the resources available at nysmaple.com and cornellmaple.com. Thanks for sticking with us.